PBR, or physics-based rendering, allows us to recreate virtually any type of material by controlling physical elements such as color, roughness, and height. PBR textures can be found in abundance online and are the key to creating more realistic materials and thus more realistic renders. In this video, I'm gonna show you how we set up PBR materials in our scenes. But first, a quick update on our asset library. Interior Collection 3 for Keyshot is now available on moment.co.uk. These 10 new photorealistic scenes were built by designers with product visualization in mind. Perhaps you're looking to test your design in realistic environments, or maybe you want to make some marketing shots for your product in situ, then Keyshot interiors by Moment are the perfect place to start. Elevate the quality of your visuals and save days in the process by picking up an interior asset today. If you're interested, I'll leave the link to moment.co.uk down in the description. So the first thing you need to do is nice and easy. Find some PBR textures online to use in your scenes. Now, like I said, these are in abundance online, both paid and free, but the site we like to go to, the one that we use for all of our Moment Keyshot assets is Ambient CG. This is all free. Everything is under public domain license, so you can use it for commercial projects. You can even distribute these textures provided they're actually used for something like in our interiors and their fantastic quality very diverse range. So once you've gone to ambientcg.com, you can then go to the materials tab and look through the vast library that they've got on here. Now to speed things up, I'm gonna go with leather and the material I'm gonna use for today's tutorial is this leather here, leather 11 in the red version. Now it's not the necessarily best looking material, especially with the scenes that we make, but it's gonna demonstrate our workflow really well because in this case the material has quite a lot of depth to it in the studding on the leather so this is going to work really well for today's demonstration before downloading your textures the only thing you need to decide is what resolution and file type you'd prefer now essentially i would look at how you're going to use this in your scene the closer to that material you're going to be with your camera for example if you're rendering your product on a wooden tabletop you're better going higher resolution and PNG. So for example, if we were rendering a product onto a tabletop, I want to get those wood textures or concrete textures in 4K PNG. And typically that means I'm not going to have too many textures around the scene because we're going to be focused on that one. So we can afford to use more resources in that small area. At the moment, when we do our latest interior scenes, because we're quite far away from them, we actually use 2K JPEGs to save on system resources and hopefully give us slightly higher rendering time. Let's go with a bit of a compromise here and go 4K JPEG. So we're not gonna get the highest quality textures, but there should be lots of resolution there to get nice and up close. So the scene we're gonna use for this tutorial today is actually our stairwell diorama scene from interior collection number three. It's a beautiful scene. It also has some PBR materials already utilized in it, such as the stone flooring and the wooden stairs, also from Ambient CG. And I've taken out the table and check, table and light, and we're going to use this sofa. It's going to be a bit of a stylistic mismatch putting the leather on here, but go with it. So the first thing you need to do is double click on the geometry where we're going to put this material and pay attention to the material type. Now, this sofa is currently a gray diffuse material. Diffuse doesn't work like anything in the real world. It's basically just a shaded color. So we need to change the material type to something more appropriate for PBR textures. Now, there's three main options that I wanna draw your attention to. The first one is plastic. For most opaque materials, plastic is absolutely fine. It's what we use for all of our interiors and we pump out, I hope, photorealistic shots all the time. And they're often using plastics. Now, the limitation of plastics is you can't do anything like metal. So if you are rendering with metals and you're getting metal PBR textures, then you need to use a metal because metal physically works fundamentally different to plastics, especially with the settings that you've got in programs like Keyshot. The last one I wanna draw your attention to is advanced. Now an advanced material can work a lot like a plastic, although it will also give you options for diffuse transmission and specular transmission, which will allow you to create translucent and transparent materials. So if you are working with anything more advanced, then you can come to the advanced material. But I'm gonna stick with plastic today because we're making an opaque material and it's not a metal. So plastic will do just fine. When you've got to that point, you can click on material graph and jump in here. If you haven't seen the material graph before, don't worry about it, I'll take you through it today. 
It's not that scary. It's just your material in graph form. But hopefully a lot of you have seen it in past tutorials. Now, once you've downloaded your material from Ambient CG or wherever else, you need to unpack it. So unzip it. I'm going to bring mine up here to show you what we actually get from that. So this is the material we're going to make, the preview. This is what we're going to end up creating. And these are the textures that I've been given from Ambient CG. Color, displacement, normal DX or direct X, uh, normal GL or open GL. Don't need to worry about those. And then roughness. Where, depending on where you get your assets from, you might get a different combination of textures to use. Now for us here, we're going to use color, displacement, either one of the normals. They're just opposites of each other. So I'm going to go normal GL and roughness. If you get ambient occlusion, you don't need to use that. Okay, that's really for uh, game engines that need to render a lot quicker. We're doing things with the proper textures. So we've got four textures here that we're going to drag straight into our material graph. I'm just going to full, full screen key shot there. So first thing we can do is start to connect some dots. Easiest one is color. Color is going to go to diffuse. Normal GL, that's going to control the bump. So a normal is just a very complex or a better bump map. So normal GL goes to bump. Roughness is going to go to roughness, which is hidden behind this plus symbol here. So that goes to there and then roughness. I'll make this a little bit larger. Organize these. And then displacement doesn't have a plugin in here. In fact, for displacement, what we're going to do is right click, geometry, displace. Plug displace into the geometry of the material and then plug displacement into displace. Now, just for the benefit of this tutorial, I'm actually going to right click this displace node and disable it for now. So disable that node so that it's not going to have an impact on our material for now. Now, just double clicking on the plastic. The other thing I'm going to check is that the specular value for now is white. And that will mean that the material is fully reflective. Doesn't necessarily mean glossy or rough. It just means that it is reflecting light. So you can see these specular reflections uh, that gives. Now, the next thing we want to do is make sure that all of these textures stay in sync on top of each other. These textures correlate with each other. Where there is a button on one, something will be happening on another. So we need to make sure they always stay overlapped. Now, the easiest way to do that, and the way we do it here at the moment, is to add a mapping 2D node. So right click in the material graph, go to utilities, and add in mapping 2D. You then take that mapping 2D node and plug that into every one of these textures. And then click on one of these textures and you want to change the mapping type at the top to node. What that will do is make this texture look back in the chain to where it gets its mapping from. So where it gets its size, how it's mapped onto the geometry, it will look back. Now, because all these three are plugged directly into this plastic node, they are in sync, which means if I double click on the roughness node now, that's also been changed to node. However, because the displacement is not plugged into there directly, this is still box. So I also need to change the mapping type here from box to node. So this one looks back up the chain now. If I want to change the mapping, the size, how these textures are projected onto this geometry, I simply need to come over to my mapping 2D and change it in here. So we've got the width and the height. If I want to make it smaller, I can do that here. And likewise, if I want to change the mapping type, I can do that there. So at this point, I'm just going to go close up on our PBR texture, like so. A little camera for that. Now that we've done a lot of the setup in the material graph. Now for me, because I got this sofa from Dimensiva, which is another 3D warehouse, I know that this sofa has been UV unwrapped. So I'm going to change the mapping type to UV. I'm not going to go into mapping types now, really. Um, but that's the best for my piece of geometry. And then I can adjust the UV scale to get it something more appropriate, like so. OK, next thing we want to look at is, is the normal correct? Now, we know buttons are supposed to come out. They're supposed to protrude from that surface or these studs. And at the moment, they're going in. Now, unfortunately, the GL and DX, they, they, do, they are the inverse of each other. But from what I found with Ambient CG, they're not always right for key shot. So in other materials, GL is right for key shot. In this case, it's not. So if you need to invert or change the bump, 
double click on your bump texture, scroll down, go to bump height. If you need to invert it, just change it to minus one. Now this is what bump is doing essentially. If I right click and disable this, bump is simulating depth on our material by adding shadow and highlights on the material where there would be if the material actually had depth. So it's very, very clever what this bump texture or this normal texture is doing. However, it is not changing the 3D geometry of the model. If you look at the top here, this is still flat. This is basically still the same shape it was in the 3D model. You can't see any bulging. And although it looks like it, it's not there. Now, you want to use normal textures really when you're further away from the geometry. Okay, if I'm looking at a wooden floor and I'm up quite high, it doesn't really matter too much what's happening you know, with the 3D geometry. It's where you're close to it, when you're looking at a material from the side, uh, where it's a bigger part of the scene maybe, that it matters more that you move towards displacement. So I'm going to disable the normal and move over to displacement now. Now, opposite to the normal map, displacement will change the 3D model. It will actually extrude. It will add and subtract from that 3D model to alter it. So double click on displacement. And the first thing we get to is displacement height. Now, uh, if this texture was white, which it looks like it pretty much is at areas, they would be displaced or extruded by this. So that's going to give you some very, very deep uh, or very yeah deep padding, which we're not going to do. So I'm going to change this maybe to 20 mil for now. See how we get on. We're not going to go with any offset because we want it to displace from the geometry that we've got here. And then the triangle size, in fact, we can leave everything else. So what I'm going to do is enable my displacement, right click enable, and then click execute geometry node. It will take a little bit of time to calculate in your, uh, in your scene, and then the displacement will be active. Okay, so in this case, the displacement height is way too high. So I'm going to start bringing this in. Let's go displacement height of 5 mil, see how we fare that. Might be a little bit too low, a little bit, 8 mil maybe. Now, every time you make a change, you do have to click this execute geometry node button just because it's quite a demanding calculation. Uh, so you do need to keep clicking that. And you get to this point. So now you can see, I think that's it might be a little bit too high, but we'll, we'll leave it in there. You can see now that there are actual changes to the geometry at the back. So this up close, like we are here, will be so much more realistic than using a bump texture. Now, the other options we've got in here for improving or in fact worsening, because you might want to worsen your displacement, is triangle size and max triangles. Now, if I click H on the keyboard, if I just click over here and click H, you'll see that my uh, scene is currently at 4.5 million triangles. Now, if I just disable my displacement and click execute, you'll see that my scene by default is about half a million triangles, okay, making up the scene. So at the moment, this displacement is using 4 million triangles, okay? Now, what you can do is bring down the triangle size, which will improve the resolution. So I could go to 1.5 millimeters for a triangle. And then I could also increase the maximum number of triangles that can be used. Now, that is the maximum number of tri triangles per piece of geometry. So if I had 10 million in here, and I'll just enable that and click execute, that'll be 10 million triangles extra on this sofa maximum. If I have two of these sofas, that's 20 million. So do be careful if you're using displacement across piece of geometry with this, okay? Because it can really chug your scene. So we're already up to 7.5 million triangles now. I'm comfortable in headroom, but as you start using it more and more, you'll find your scene getting slower, bogged down, bigger file sizes. And that's where we do rely more on normal if we can, unless we're really up close, in which case we'll use displacement. But there you go. That's a little bit of a look on how displacement works. For the rest of this tutorial, it doesn't really matter what I go for. I'm going to go with the normal just so it runs a little bit quicker. Disable my displacement, enable my normal, and then back to it. Now, we've already seen the benefit of using the mapping 2D node because of this floating displacement texture out here. But I'm going to show you another benefit of using mapping 2D in that we can change, break these chains to add other nodes and really utilize the material graph. So for example, changing the color of this texture here. Change the color, we want a color adjust. We can get that by right-clicking the line that goes to diffuse, 
go to utilities and add in a color adjust. You'll see no change just by adding that in. It'll be absolutely the same. But if I wanted to change the hue, I could start to move the hue slider. Perhaps I want more of a burnt orange tan leather. Then I can change that hue in there. And again, because we've got all of these synced with the mapping 2D node, these are all still in sync. I can break up this chain as much as I want. Without that mapping 2D, this would now be out of sync with these two, okay? And then you, if you do change the scale, you don't have that layered effect unless you change it on all of them. Likewise, another node that you might wanna use for roughness, a popular one, is color to number. So if I right click the line from roughness, utilities, color to number, and for this case, I'm gonna hit C on the keyboard to preview what this texture looks like mapped to my geometry. If I wanted to decrease the roughness of this material, I could simply start bringing down the output to so the maximum roughness of this material. As you see, it gets darker. And then I've got a more glossy, more polished uh, leather in this case. I'm gonna leave that as default, but again, these are all still in sync. Now, you also don't have to use all of the textures that are made available to you. For example, if I wanted to define the color of this, then I could simply just disable anything that goes into the diffuse. And then I've got my regular color picker in this material here. Now, for leather, it's not very realistic. You would expect to have some sort of color variation in there, which is where the color texture works well. But if I wanted to go for pitch black leather, I could just set it in there. That would mean I can delete that texture out, save more space in the scene in terms of memory usage. And you can still see that my roughness and my bump effects are still present there. So don't feel the need to use all of your textures if you don't need to, you can mix and match. A good example of this would be painted brick. Okay, so you can use a paint material, you could have it in white paint, but then you could use the displacement, the normal, maybe even the roughness of that uh, to add it on, but you're not gonna use that brown or cement color brick because you're just overlaying paint on top of it. Now, because it takes a bit of time to set up PBR materials, there's absolutely a use case for saving them to your materials library, which is something that we do here. So if I click M on the keyboard to bring up my library in the materials tab, you can see that we've got a collection of CC0 materials that we've started saving to our library. Now, in this case, I could call this leather 011 and then click save and then find our CC0 materials and then click OK to save that material to our library where we can deploy it on the next scene without having to go through that setup. The last thing that I really want to mention is that you might find textures with different names, different styles available from different websites. Now, a good example of this would be polygon.com, which is really, really popular for product and interior visualization. Now, they give you gloss and specular maps to use in your scenes. Now, in those cases, they do actually have YouTube tutorials on how to plug them in. It's much the same method, only you have to do some inverting, either in Keyshot or Photoshop when you use that textures. For example, Keyshot works in roughness, not gloss. Gloss is the inverse of roughness, so you need to flip it round. You can often find a lot of instruction online, but hopefully what I've shown you in this tutorial is enough to get you going, unlocks the ambient CG library of materials, which is vast, and now you can use PBR materials to start creating whatever materials you want. Concrete, fabrics, wood, wood flooring, stone, leather, all of them will get better. Now you can use PBR materials and use them efficiently in Keyshot. So I hope this tutorial has been really helpful. If you did enjoy it, please like the video, it means a lot to me. And if you're not a subscriber, get subscribed so that you don't miss out on any future Keyshot content. If you're interested in acquiring some Moment Keyshot assets, the link to that is down in the video description. Until then, happy rendering folks, and I'll see you in the next one.